you are listening to When Christians Speak Talk Radio. When Christians Speak Talk Radio believes in the mandate from Christ when he said that we should go into all the world and As preach the good news for the gospel of to everyone. Today's broadcast is the Alabaster Box with Prophet Carla R. Johnson. So get comfortable, take notes, and know that God has a word for you. Welcome to the Alabaster Box with Prophet Carla R. Johnson. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. I want to welcome you to the broadcast today. This is the Alabaster Box with Prophet Carla R. Johnson. Amen. We have a special guest. Amen. Uh, I want to say pastor, but I want to make sure. Our first lady, amen, Julie. Julia Bennett, Amen, is with us. Amen. We're gonna. This is the the month, domestic violence awareness month, and uh, we're gonna turn everything over to her after we do the, the, the prophet call. After we do the prayer, but go call somebody, let somebody know we are broadcasting live right now. Amen. The telephone number, the calling number is six four six four seven eight zero six six zero. The chat room has also be able, has been open. Man, we are excited about what God is doing. If you are suffering. Right now, through any kind of domestic violence, we encourage you to get help that is needed. Amen. So, Prophet Kali, if you don't mind, I'm going to go ahead and pray, and then I'm going to turn everything over to you, okay? Amen. Amen. So, Father God, again, we say thank you for today. We thank you, God, for this broadcast, Lord Jesus. That a the box. God, we give the broadcast to you. We pray, Lord Jesus, it will begin to touch the lives of your people, God. It will begin to touch the lives of those that don't even know you, but those that might be going through domestic violence, and those that may be trying to find help, God. We pray, Lord Jesus, that your people will be able to listen to what you have given to, to these great women of God to say, God, because you've given them words in their belly, God, that they might prophesy, they might teach, and they might educate, God. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for the testimony that they have. So, Lord Jesus, we want you to have your way today, God. We want lives to be changed. We want lives and relationships to be changed. We want help to be given out, God, to wherever they might be, all across this great world that you have created, God. We do thank you in advance, God, for those that will be listening to the broadcast live and those that will be listening to the archive, God. This is truly all about your glory. And we want to just represent and praise you and thank you and do all those things necessary so that you will get all the glory, Lord Jesus, so that somebody will be helped through this ministry, so so that somebody's life will be changed, so that somebody will cry out, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to change my life, God? So we give every single one to you in Christ Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. 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 Praise God. I just want to thank everyone for joining us this evening. This is Prophet Carla. Um, I just want to thank Reverend Ray for allowing me to uh, be a voice on his broadcast when Christians speak talk radio and with the Alabaster Box show. Um, I also want to thank my sister in Christ, Julie Bennett. Um, I also want to congratulate her on her new um, found love in her marriage to her husband. Um, I just want to, you know, pray for blessings over them. And she's been on the broadcast several times pouring into the men and women of God. And I just want to thank her for the sacrifices she's made as an advocate to help women and men suffering through domestic violence situations um, and just taking the time out even through her own journey and struggles. Um, and I'm just happy that God is giving you someone to love and to spend the rest of your life with. Um, Amen. I just want you all to bear with me because I'm fighting a cold. So if I sound crazy or if I get muted out, just bear with me. But mm-hmm. nevertheless, this was a very important broadcast, and I didn't want to cancel because last year, Um, When we did this broadcast, it was one of our highest rated broadcasts because there is such a need, especially in the body of Christ, because this is domestic violence is not just something that affects Americans or uh, a few people here and there. It's truly an epidemic, and it's something that just like we speak out against sexual abuse and sexual violence, we also speak out against domestic violence because it's one of those silent things in the church. And not very many pastors or ministry leaders address domestic violence in the pulpit. So there's many women, um, men as well, and children suffering in silence 
because of the struggles that they're dealing with behind closed doors. And this is something that we want to shed light on, and not just one time during the year, but we want to shed light all throughout the year because it's something that um, our ministry leaders, our members of our churches, our communities, our children in school, everyone is affected by domestic violence. So we just want to have a casual conversation about it and this isn't just directed towards women because we know there are men out there who suffer with domestic violence. And so we do have people that are a part of our broadcast who can help you or direct you to someone where you can get help. You do not have to suffer in silence. So we're going to get started and just have this open conversation and dialogue so that someone out there can get the help that they need, and even family members. I know there's many of us who know a family member who's suffering in silence. They don't know how to get help. It's a struggle for them to leave the situation. I want to talk to Julie just about the work that she does and just the things that she sees out there and how we can step in as a community to help those people that we do see suffering in silence. Okay, well, thank you, Carla, and um, uh, Reverend Ray, I'm really honored to just be back on this amazing show. I know it blesses people around the world, so um, this is definitely an important topic that we have to touch upon because so many times we're just suffering in silence, and I am a firm believer, and I say this over and over again to victims, to survivors, to family members, that watching and not doing is just the same as enabling the person who's abusing the victim um, because you're not doing anything. And um, the biggest misconception, I think, about domestic violence is that we are so quick, even as Christians and as the body of Christ, to cast judgment. Even Mm -hmm. if it's not verbal judgment, we look bad upon our family members, friends that we know, because so often we hear people say, well, why doesn't she just leave? Like, it's so easy to leave. Like, I don't get why she's still with him. I guess she wants it or she wants to be abused or, um, you know, we've offered her help. She doesn't want to take it or we've offered her help and she goes back. Why does she go back? And that is a form of casting judgment. So often we don't see that. So the biggest thing is, is that right now where we are in this generation, in this world, we have one of the highest um, uh, death tolls ever in even just alone if you address African-American communities in domestic violence. Um, I know last year I, lo- I lost a soror to domestic violence. Um, I'm, I'm an AKA, so, you know, that was big. It was all over the news, and she was a very educated woman who, you know, who was active in church and her community, and she had actually left her ex-husband, and he was so upset he came back and beat her to death in Texas and then also attacked her children. So, you know, it's just a form of understanding that these things are continuously arising and these situations continuously happen, And the biggest thing that we can do as family members and as supporters um, is not only go educate ourselves, but also educate law enforcement, educate our pastors and our leadership so that they know what to do when they need to be equipped to, to assist the victim because sometimes it's not as easy as it seems. So oftentimes what we find is that a lot of victims, end up dying and succumbing to um, domestic violence simply because they lost their support system. You might not understand the support you're giving to your sister, your cousin, your mother, your friend, your your coworker, your your member just within your church, um, just by simply giving them support and not judging them and telling them that you're there for them and reassuring them that, that when they're ready – you will be there for that you will be there for them simply because it's not as easy as it may appear um due to several factors um so in that i think that it's so important that we also address how do we not only set up shelters in place for our victims of domestic violence but how do we also ensure you know and men are victims too which we'll touch upon later on in the show but when we're focusing on women that our women are educated that they have everything that they need so that they are independent and um, not codependent of their spouse who might be abusing them. Um, You know, what do we have in the church where we can facilitate, you know, giving them jobs and shelter and everything else so that they might feel secure, hey, I I can leave my husband now. What forms of therapy will they be offered? If If their husbands are the only ones working, 
And they feel like, well, I have to stay because I have the kids. I won't be able to support myself. I've been just a homemaker. I've been at home. I've been supporting my husband through his career and all of those other things. Like, what are we doing in a church to step up and say, okay, this is what we have in place. This is the shelter we can provide where she'll be protected in the kids. This is the next step of action where she can go back to school and where we'll be able to help her and get clothing and, and get shelter and everything else in place. So those are all of the factors that we don't think about when we look upon someone that's a victim of domestic violence, everything just seems so simple because it's always, well, why doesn't she just do this or do that? And it's just not as easy as it seems. So I think that that is the first thing that we have to address, especially within the church. And, you know, just, you know, what structures do we have in place to, to really help? And then also, and Carla, I know you and I have talked about that in the past as well, what do we do if the wife and the husband stays and they come for counseling and say, you know what, my husband keeps physically abusing me or psychologically, emotionally abusing me? We're going to talk about the different factors of domestic violence in a moment. Like, you know, mm-hmm. how do you address that? Like, how do you address that? What proper scriptures do you give them? How do you ensure that if they can't afford actual therapy that we're set up within the church to give them proper counseling to ensure that this stops? that the cycle of abuse stops. So, you know, those are all the factors that we have to address that we just don't think about every day or prey on, so to speak. I think those are really good points, especially um, I was watching a documentary about women and men who are abused in the church. And one of the most common um, things that everyone said who was in a domestic violence situation was that a pastor should never offer counseling unless he is qualified to counsel in those types of situations. Because many times in the body of Christ, you know, nowadays anybody can become a clergyman. You can get licensed to be a minister. You don't need to be ordained or anointed, appointed, all of those things. You don't need to be educated. Uh, anyone can call themselves a pastor or a minister. And so it's very important that, like you said, to your point, we should have people in place who are qualified to help people in crisis situations. Does your church have a crisis support team who can help sexual abuse victims, domestic violence victims, who at a moment's notice, if you get a phone call, can you help someone find shelter if they're in that type of crisis situation? Do you know what proper authorities to contact? Um, With the counseling, the, the, the one thing that they said that they had a problem with as a domestic violence victim with a pastor counseling them is that they feel their situation is not uh, over arguing over finances or we're arguing over marital issues. It's not that type of issue. This person who's abusing you has an anger issue that they need separate individual counseling. And the victim also needs counseling, but to put those two people together as a pastor and say, well, God says this, you know, you ought to love your wife as Christ loves the church oftentimes you are putting that person in danger of even more abuse when they leave counseling because of the things you may bring up or say in that counseling session. Correct. Yeah, and and I completely agree with you. And, um, and, you know, and sometimes, too, um, you'll also find where it's on the back end of things where, you know, someone might say, well, you know, you have to stay within this marriage, you have to stay married to this person. Um, That's what God ordained for you. So that's the reason why I think Mm -hmm. it's very important, like you stated, that we really have clergy, um, be it a man or woman, um, that will be able to not act out of what they think is right, but really use biblical principle and really pray on things before you counsel people that are hurting to that capacity to really touch them and say, Lord, use me and give me the word in accordance to your word, to, to the Holy Bible that's going to set this couple free or this married um, couple free that's going to heal those hurts and to guide me in the right way versus saying, well, first of all, you know, you're supposed to stay married and or, or just even on the person that's um, doing that's that's causing the abuse, um, you know, how do we effectively still love them through this period without just, 
you know, casting them down because clearly the number one thing that I also heard you mention, Carla, is anger. And, um, you know, a lot of times what people don't realize is that we often still just replicate behaviors, and that could be man or woman, that we've mm-hmm. seen ongoing that our childhood, childhood things that we saw within our childhood. So you might be 45, 35, 29, you know, or 17, just um, reacting to um, triggers or emotions or, or outbursts, angry outbursts, that you might have seen your father and mother um, do or your great your, your grandparents or whoever was there that raised you. Um, although it's not an excuse, we have to identify the root cause of, of the why is why people act the way they do. Why is this abused woman still staying within a situation? Is it something that she saw her mother do, her grandmother do? Is it something that she sees normal? Why does this man feel like it's okay to abuse this woman? Is it something that he, that he saw his father do, his grandfather do is it just something within him why is he so angry why does he feel like it's okay what is it you know is he an alcoholic does he have a drug drug addiction like we really have to get to the root of it in order to really resolve the the root cause issues that Mm -hmm. are within that person because i'm a firm believer that god can really come in and change anyone that he chooses to of course he can heal them and you know and god will forgive each and every one of the, the the individuals, the parties involved. But we also have to put in the work and the psychological work that's needed to really ensure that this stops and then we speak out about it. And then we're able to not cast shame or fear upon the victim or the perpetrator, but really address the issue and the core issues per individual couple or per person. And then also we have to remember the children um, most of the time, the ones that are always forgotten about, and that's something I actually wrote about in my book, are the kids. What people don't realize is the fact that children who witness domestic violence in the homes, and domestic violence is not just physical assault. It can be psychological assault. It can be sexual abuse. We always forget about that portion of it. Um, it can be verbal, you know, in front of the children, the fighting, hostility, uh, throwing things, breaking things, um, you know, using items to hit your spouse, um, you know, different things like that. Those are all forms of domestic, domestic violence abuse, financial abuse, controlling of money, stalking, when you stalk the person that you're married to or that you might be engaged to and, you know, and continuously trying to exercise a unreasonable amount of control over that person all of that constitutes domestic violence well if you have children that are involved they're witnessing these things and they are not able to um to be able to rise to the occasion of of transforming their thoughts the way they need to to grow into the, the humans that they need to grow into and the number one factor that is actually psychology has actually linked to domestic violence in children is also post-traumatic stress disorder So people don't realize that, you know, throwing stuff at each other, um, you know, when you're a mother being abused in front of your children, um, it's not just, oh, they don't understand, oh, it's going to get better. Your kids are really um, even more so harmed by by having to witness the behaviors. So it's just as much, and psychology will suggest, and this is statistics, you guys can look it up, it will tell you that even if the children never get physically harmed by anything that they with the, any domestic violence encounters that they witness, it still has the same exact effect as if it was if it was them being abused. So that alone is heartbreaking. Just to know that if you're witnessing your mother getting brutally beaten or spit on or continuously talk down to or less that, that that hostility, you know, it doesn't create a safe environment for the kids. And then it affects them the same way as you're doing it to them. So you're thinking, I'm not doing anything. I'm just doing it to your mom if you're the father abusing or even for, for women. You know, women are abusers too. It's not just men that go and abuse their women. It's women that physically, psychologically, emotionally abuse their spouses and fiancés and people that they are with in front of their children. So it's, it has the same impact um, despite of, of, your, of your gender, so to speak. 
So, you know, that's something that we have to be cognizant about and um, something that we also have to speak on and something we have to be cognizant about within the church when we're dealing with um, all of the parties involved to never forget the children because those are the, the, the people that are going to grow into adult human beings that are never going to forget those encounters and to ensure that they're covered and that they don't repeat the same behaviors. And specifically for women, we often see that young girls grow into women and they, you know, repeat that cycle of going to become domestic violence victims because they perceive it as normal if that's what they saw and no one ever told them that it's not normal for you to be physically abused this way or to be loved in this capacity and everything else. And then men typically, boys grow into men, and, you know, sometimes they also become abusers a lot of the time. So, you know, it's just a cycle that has to stop, and we have to look at each component of it. Right. One thing that you said that I want to fast forward to is typical characteristics. And a lot of times we think that a domestic violence um, abuser is, you know, the drunk, uh, you know, drug addicted man um, who just comes home drunk and beats on his wife or his girlfriend. But in the church, we don't typically see that behavior. Many times, it's the charismatic, charming uh, man of authority who may be in a leadership position um, or a woman who can be in a leadership position who's very controlling, domineering. Um, talk about, you know, when, when we're in those positions and you look up to someone and they have that authority and they carry that with them, and then you have the wife or the husband who is, living this secret life in the ministry, how do we address those issues? And Reverend Ray, feel free to chime in because, I, you know, I have never necessarily, I've seen men be verbally abusive in the church. Wow. I've never seen, you know, I, I don't live in anyone's home. I haven't seen it behind closed doors, but I don't know of anyone who's been physically abusive, but a lot of times we have this mentality because we kind of transform the scripture to fit our situation and feel like we have to be a ruler over our wives because God said that you're the head and, you know, you have dominion. We think that we should control our wives because in the ministry, they, you know, statistics show that Christian homes tend to have more domestic violence than non-Christian homes simply because of that principle. So how do you deal with that situation when you have someone in a high leadership position in church and you have someone, a family who's going through this, you know, it's hard to address because you don't see that side of a person. Yeah. Right. And um, I think to just to, to just follow up on what you're saying, it's just um, how to even identify identify – the root cause of that early on, too, and prevention tactics, like you stated, like everything, you know, how, how do you identify it and how do you address it in the church, but also um, how do you know that that's what it's going to lead to and how do you ensure that, um, first of all, I, I think all pastoral staff should have a measure of not just for sexual abuse and child abuse training, but the same thing for domestic violence, like where they quarterly, they have to receive some sort of training, and to be able to identify that, because most of the times, like you said, those that are abusing their, their spouses, specifically just within the church, um, they are those charismatic. It could be, even be the pastor. It could be the head deacon, the head minister um, that's doing this. And, of course, it's covered up. So um, at least to the outer man it is. And so um, the biggest thing with that is, is, you know, like how do we know what to look for? Um, what are the typical signs of what to look for? How do you know how to address certain things? The number one thing that I can um, respond to in that is that oftentimes you just really have to know the signs. You have to look for the behaviors. You have to understand and get close to people to see how they behave. If there's a woman, for instance, in church, I'm, you know, let's say hypothetically she could be the first lady, 
where, you know, you, you see the behaviors. If you watch the man and woman interact and you see that, you know, during certain times, all of a sudden she stops smiling or she can only speak to certain people when you see perhaps that that pastor might be around or different controlled situations is the number one way to identify potential domestic violence or something that's, un, that's not healthy because that fear factor never disappears. Nobody is that great of an actor. I usually say children are, but but usually adults, they express that fear in a different way, especially women. Like no one's that great of an actor to where you just you just have to recognize the signs. And so it's our duty, I feel, Carlin and, and, and Reverend, to, um, to just identify the root and to know exactly what to look for and to have those advocates within the church the same way you can say you can spot when someone – you know, it's just, you know, not doing something right, or you can identify this trend or identify something else, you should be able to have dedicated resources within the church that can identify things, and that's not going to, you know, maybe make a big broadcast about it, but really address it because that's what they're studying on. Um, that they know exactly, oh, this is the potential risk of it, or and, they, and then it's also how do you address those people? Like, what if it is your pastor? And all of a sudden you feel like, oh, you know, this might be going on with First Lady. I've recognized the patterns. How do you address it then? So sometimes it's just a simple fix of giving them information, like going up to the First Lady or the potential victim who you might have identified to be the victim and say, hey, you know, if you know any educational resources in your community, which is the number one thing that we should be doing, also knowing, like, what we have within our community as resources to assist for counseling, um, for shelters, if we don't have it in place within um, where we can assist, you know, what is it that we have within our communities where you can give that person the information needed for when they are ready to escape without having to address it, say, hey, here's some information I have, um, where you don't say, hey, I think or I feel led that, you know, something is going on with you or someone is hurting you or pastor is hurting you. You can always just give them the information needed and say, hey, I don't know, maybe you know someone that might need this. Um, this is what I know about domestic violence. This is what it looks like. There's help. There's hope. Even offering scripture at that point, but really being um, careful about how you state things and, and then giving them the information just so you know that you've done your due diligence to give them the information and then they have it. And then they know there might be hope for me or there's something else I can look into. And that's what statistics also show, that once people receive the information, they usually go look. And most of the times, even if you research anything on domestic violence, you always see escape buttons now. So if, like, the victim is, you know, going to their smartphone to type in the information you might have given them, if the pastor, whoever's abusing them, comes over to them, they can just press escape, and it's like they're, they're just looking at their screen. So different things like that, I think, are like different tactics that you can put in place if you think that you've identified a potential victim of domestic violence within your own circle that's never said anything, there aren't any visible marks or bruises. Again, it's not just physical. It can be psychological. It can be money control. Different things like that. Um, you know, give them the resources. Give them the information that they need so they can at least be informed and then just keep a close eye on them and continuously pray and cover them because God will reveal all things in due time. Amen. Amen. One thing that you, that you said that really um, stuck out was just that codependence aspect of domestic violence because many times, you know, with that control piece, I know a lot of people are probably saying, well, what's wrong with the husband managing the finances or controlling the finances. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But the problem comes in when you use that to keep someone in a domestic violence situation, in an abusive relationship where you're controlling the finances and you're controlling their basic daily needs because you want to have this control over them. That is where the problem comes in. And so it's important that, you have this loving, mutually respectful relationship so that, you know, and women, it is okay. I'm a firm believer that it is okay to have your own. It is okay to, if if you have a job, have a conversation with your spouse about setting aside money in a savings or whatnot. There is nothing wrong with being financially free and stable in your own right. Because we work together as man and wife to build a life together, but 
those situations come about, many women end up in situations where they don't want to leave because they are not financially stable enough on their own to leave a situation. And that's why many couples stay married, period, no matter what the situation is. They may want out, but they stay together because of financial reasons. And that can be the, a hardship on a woman who's trying to leave with her children or a man who is trying to leave the situation. And it's important that, with, like she said, you find a shelter, find a place where you can get the help you need. But as a community, we also need to make sure that we're giving back to those shelters because many of those shelters do take donations, whether it's financial, it's material things, Children have needs, the women have needs, and these shelters don't always have all of the financial resources that they need to be able to provide the best things for the people that are coming into them on a regular basis. So I am going to post a link to where you can find help if you need help on our uh, With Christian Speak Facebook page, but also um, links where you can find a shelter and make a donation whether it's financial, whether it's food, whether it's coats for the, the children, the weather is about to change, whatever you can give, it's important as a community that we work together to give back because there are so many women who need our help, so many men and children who need our help as a body of Christ that you don't have to just be involved in the sense of breaking up the domestic violence situation. You can be involved in other ways by giving. So I encourage you um, as a community, as a body of Christ, to maybe get together with your local church and think of things that you can maybe give for maybe Christmas. I mean, look at all the Christmas is coming up, Thanksgiving is coming up, holidays. That can be the most, uh, that is the highest suicide time of the year. And it's important that we make Mm -hmm. these people feel like, we have your back. You have a support system. If your family isn't there, guess what? We'll step up as a body of Christ, and we'll make sure that you're taken care of. And that is where we lack as the body of Christ. Mm-hmm. And that is so true. And, and, and that's that's the other portion of it, too, is just, um, you know, what do you do? Because we're, we're so busy. I mean, we have lives. You know, Carla, you can appreciate this as well as as being a wife and you have children and you have day-to-day life, like, you know, if you're listening and you've never even heard anything about domestic violence, you might have seen it on TV or you hear about it, but you, you grew up in maybe like a safe home where everything was okay. You know, you might say, well, how does this apply to me? Like, why, why should I care? I don't, I don't have any friends that have gone through that. Well, praise God for you. It's a great thing that you've never seen it. You've never had to endure it. You've never had to witness it. Or you might think that you don't know anyone that's ever gone through it. But the truth is, is that one out of four women and one out of seven men is affected by domestic violence. So the factor between that is, is if you get into a room, okay, so if your congregation has about 100 people in there and you start counting off, like somebody in there is currently being abused. And numbers never lie. So, again, um, you know someone, you just don't realize that you do. So it is a call of action, and it's really our duty here on earth to get educated in each capacity that we can, especially in terms of domestic violence and different things that might not apply to us, because what, what we don't want to happen, and I've seen this over and over again, is that people don't really care about these, these subjects. It's like it doesn't apply to me, eh, don't really care about it. And then suddenly, you know, a horrible tragedy happens. And then it's like, oh, wow, what is domestic violence about? What could I have done to prevent it? Um, You know, why didn't I know more? And a tragedy could be in, you know, a family. You know, most of the time it results in a family member being killed or it happening to someone that you love. And, um, you know, so it's so important to do our, our due diligence and at least getting educated. There's so, there are so many resources out there that tell us exactly, you know, in more detail what domestic violence is. There's so many shelters that we have, but the truth also is, and that's the heartbreaking truth behind it, is that there aren't enough shelters. Um, throughout our our communities, throughout the, the United States, to hold all of our domestic violence victims. 
So a lot of times, like I had a friend in um, uh, Tennessee, she, she wrote a book and everything else. She, she's fantastic, a big domestic violence advocate. And um, she told me about instances where, you know, she would take, pack up her kids, go to the shelter, and they would have to turn her away. And her family had turned her, their backs on her. Everyone turned their backs on her because she wouldn't leave the person that she was with. And, um, you know, so her and her children were just out of the fence for themselves. So then all she could do is go return back to the, the hands of the abuser. And abuse kept, you know, of course, getting worse and worse, especially because she tried to leave several times. Um, and, and then it was just a lack of education of knowing, um, you know, well, this shelter is, is closed and, you know, she tried to call different churches. No one was there to open up their doors and say, Hey, come in here. You have a place to stay because we, we just don't think about those things, especially in churches. So, um, you know, I think it's so important to really consider, um, adding some type of safe haven component throughout our communities within our churches. Um, and even if that safe haven is within a, a couple's home or, or what have you, where they, they will offer to take up, hey, in case this happens, we have this emergency, emergency in our church. Here are the 10, 10 members within our church that stated um, they will take up a family for a month or two. Um, you know, until they get on their feet, they will provide shelter. This is the protection we're going to put in place. Um, being in contact with your local police stations is very helpful as well, not only in you getting educated, but as a church to be able to say, hey, we have offers to so-and-so, he's going to come help. You know, we know that you need to be in protective custody. Office of so-and-so will help. But then we also sometimes find in certain communities that police officers don't really understand Um, how severe domestic violence is or they just don't care. Now it seems because so many death tolls, the death tolls are rising in um, the amount of domestic violence cases that we're seeing across our nation every day to the point that now it's like very high on the radar so they're getting educated and everything else. So really tying in those community forms and then getting educated on those topics and then saying, even if I don't understand anything about domestic violence, I'm willing to learn and willing to maybe even with the material that I learned, hey, go pass it on the church just so they're educated. Have a workshop on it for free because I've educated myself, even if it doesn't directly impact me. Now that I understand there is somebody that I know that is suffering in silence and needs to be educated, I want to do something about this. You know, that is what I think is absolutely something that is essential and that will help one person that is currently suffering in silence um, just by you passing out the information, you might be passing out the information to them and they're just looking at you and, and thinking internally, thank you, and one day I will get out of this. Or you might be passing information along to them that will make them decide that day to leave and the next day would have been the day that they would have gotten killed. Right. I have a, I, I do have a question to ask you, um, Julie. And mm-hmm. um, my, my question is this. What if you have a situation where that you know that there's domestic violence um, taking place in the home or uh, in an environment, and uh, the person do not want help, you know, uh, whether it's based off of fear or whether it's based off of finances, how would you respond if you, you see it and you know for a fact that it's going on? What kind of, what would you do in that kind of situation? Um, that's a very, very great question. The biggest thing that I can say with that is to always be prepared and okay. also to, um, at that point, also contact law enforcement. And you might look like the worst person ever, but um, contacting law enforcement. So say, for instance, you know, someone comes and you see visible bruises um, right. on them or, you know, they, they've confided this in you and they say, hey, please do not tell anyone. I am 100% encouraging you to go tell. Okay. To go because what's going to happen is, um, you know, law enforcement will come out. And, of course, you know, we pray that it doesn't have any more horrible um, implications. But once law enforcement gets informed, then the victim might get very angry. But they might also see, like my friend that I mentioned, she said that's what actually saved her. One of her coworkers said after she came back with bruises again and everything else, that's the final thing that saved her, ended up saving her life because she just didn't feel like she could leave. It's the fact that one of her coworkers went and, and, did, and called law enforcement. 
Um, so they got involved and everything else because she kept protecting her abuser because that's what she thought she had to do out of fear. Right, it wasn't right. love. It wasn't anything else. It was just fear. So contacting law enforcement, if law enforcement doesn't get involved, we have so many resources that will local domestic violence organizations. Um, if you read, excuse me, if you're researching, research them depending on state, that will tell you exactly what to do and will tell you exactly what help to get, especially if there are children involved and the kids have to witness that on a day-to-day basis. Um, once the families realize that, the, the you know, the children are involved and everything else, um, you know, unfortunately CPS, Child Protective Services, can get involved in that, in that moment just because of the severity of the impact that it has on the kids and that research keeps insinuating, um, you know, the, the trauma that the kids sustain by having to witness that. So um, I would just say, you know, go for it and just go law enforcement. And if law enforcement doesn't help, go to the next reporting agency. Um, but report, report, report um, until something is done um, so that they can get away. But being right. silent and just saying, oh, we're just going to pray about it. Yeah, pray and pray that they get the healing that they need because those scars are going to remain and there's so many, so much more work that would have to be done afterwards. But unfortunately, uh, and I use this term loosely, you know, you have to be the villain. Somebody has to speak up and has to do something about it, and you're the one to do it. One thing I do want to say about speaking up is that don't just speak up because you're an a nosy gossiping person and you just want like to see the fallout because a lot of times there are people who just don't want to see you whole. They want, they just thrive off of the struggle that you're going through. And there's a lot of people out there be very careful about getting involved in the situation, especially where that's a very sensitive situation. And, you know, you, we all know people in the church who are just nosy. But we also Mm -hmm. want to make sure that if we are getting involved, like to Julie's point, we're not putting that person in more danger because if you plan to go to the authorities, you need to make sure that you have a plan in place, that if that backfires because the police says there's nothing documented, it will come out, but we don't see any bruises or we don't see any evidence, you know, it's important that those things get documented for that purpose, but if the police leave because they don't see something going on, are you putting that person in more danger? And if so, do you have a backup plan, a place for them to stay, for them and their children to go to? Uh, Can they stay with you? Do you have something lined up? Do you have food and clothing and shelter available for them if something does jump off because now the authorities are involved and this man or woman is even more angry now because – you've gotten involved. So just you have to be very, like she said, pray about it, use wisdom, use discernment, but make sure that right. you're not putting that person in more danger. Right. And when contacting uh, law enforcement and everything else, and that's a very good point, um, you have to do everything uh, in a very silent manner. So like Carla stated, don't make a big announcement. Don't go tell the victim, I'm going to call the police. I'm going to do this. You just do it, and the police actually has the um, – Um, It's required to keep everything confidential anyways. So you contacting them, you should do it in a measure of no one ever knowing that you're the one that did it. Um, Because you could also put yourself in grave danger on top of that if, you know, they don't get away or if the police chooses to not prosecute. But the whole point behind that would be is the fact that it is, like Carla stated, at least a documented instance. And if it keeps building up, uh, they will just keep a record of it. And um, But if the police, like now they're enforcing it, it depends on the state. But I know here, for instance, now that I'm in California, what they do if the police comes to your home and they see that there are visible bruises because somebody reported it, then and they see children, that they will take the children out of the home, they will take the woman out of the home and offer you a place to stay and offer you whatever you need. But, you know, not every state has that right now and doesn't have that capacity right now. So absolutely, Carla, um, being prepared to help the victim at that point, but also to know that you're doing it in in an an 
anonymous, sorry, anonymous way um, to to also keep yourself and your family safe. So it shouldn't be something that you go do a big announcement about. Don't announce it to the victim. Then announce it to anyone. It's just something that you should go do to ensure that. And every time you see a bruise, every time you might see something, law enforcement should, by law, they cannot turn you down. If they do, then you need to go to the prosecutor, prosecutor's office and report that as well. Um, you know, because there's a fine line, but what we don't want to happen is to know that you sat there and, um, and we did nothing. And then one day we turn on the news and see that they're on the news because the victim was killed. Thank you. One thing that I do want to address is we talked about building crisis support teams in the ministry, making sure that there are trained advocates, um, I know in ministry there's we pull from different um, resources because we have law enforcement who attend ministries, we have lawyers, we have um, people who work with the system, social workers. You know, it, it's great to be able to pull from those resources when you have them in your church, but if you don't have them, like Julie said, it's important to get the training that, so that you have, just like we have, you know, some churches have crisis teams, you know, emergency response teams. If someone has, like, you know, a medical emergency, we should also have a crisis support team for people who have those type of tra- traumatic emergencies. And so it's important. The confidentiality piece is so important because in right. ministries, we tend to have loose lips. <laughs> we tend yeah. mm-hmm. to tell everybody's business because did you know so-and-so was getting beat by her husband? Did you know? No. We don't need anybody gossiping or, or spreading more lies because that's why people don't tell their business. They don't share because there's no one that they can trust. And so it's important that as ministry leaders or pastors, community leaders, that we pinpoint people that have integrity, that are going to be confidential and keep those things under wraps because it's hard enough as a victim, whether it's sexual abuse or domestic violence, to break your silence but to have someone go out and tell other people what's going on can be devastating. So we mm-hmm. need to make sure that we're being confidential and making sure that that person's privacy is being protected. Amen. One of the things. Absolutely. Uh, uh, we're almost out of time. But one of the things that you mentioned was about training. And my question to um, you, Prophet Kali and uh, Pastor Julie, is uh, if if a church was interested in getting um, training as far as dealing with domestic violence or any of those things, what direction would they go as far as leadership? Um, Car- uh, Carla, do you want me to answer it? Or? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Well, um, usually, okay, so per state, of course, we have the National Domestic Violence uh, Hotline that you can mm-hmm. contact, and also um, the website is www thehotline.org, um, or you can also call 1-800-799-7233. They help domestic violence victims, but they also will give you a plan in place per your state and county that um, where they will help host workshops or whatever within your region. But also calling, um, if you look like on your local, state, or county website, um, I mean, like even the smallest towns, I know like one of the small cities, for instance, that my brother used to live in in Tennessee, Shelbyville, Tennessee, even on their local county website, they had a training play, training thing in place for domestic violence. So each uh, town actually now is pretty much um, required to have someone there that's able to train and if you call them and say, hey, I want to have this workshop for my church, um, they will come do it pro bono. If you have no one else, if you don't have a social worker within um, your church that can do it or anyone else or advocates, um, your local county office um, should be able to facilitate someone or your local um, from, you know, the, the county health department or what have you, should be able to facilitate someone that can come out and give and offer up free domestic violence classes. Or even looking for local organizations, domestic violence organizations, they are always um, 
usually 100% willing to come out and to say, hey, uh, I'm, I'm honored that you called. What can we do to raise awareness within your church? So, you know, it's just a matter of researching who's in your local area or calling the national hotline, and they will absolutely put you in contact with someone that will facilitate that workshop or come educate you in a, a group of whoever you may have um, within your church that's interested. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, again, everyone, you have been listening to When Christmas Be Talk Radio. This has been his um, alabaster, alabaster box with Prophet Collar uh, Johnson. And, of course, we have Pastor Julie with us. Amen. Um, Bennett, um, um, again, uh, do give congratulations. Um, for those that may not know, I think you still have still have a book out on Amazon.com, right? It, it stops with you. Amen. Yes, I do. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you can um, find out about the book if you go to Amazon.com, Com, Amen. Um, it starts with you, by uh, um, Pastor Julie, Amen. So we are excited about that too, Amen. Uh, if someone wanted to get in contact with you, Pastor Julie, and uh, I'm not trying to take over Prophet Kyle, okay? No, no, no. <laughs> if someone wanted to get in contact with you for maybe a workshop or anything, how would they go about doing that? Or 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 Pastor yes. or Prophet Kyle, okay? Um, for me, you can just uh, email me. We have our our nonprofit Facebook page that's still up as well, but you can just email me at um, juliefrancejohnson at yahoo.com. And um, our nonprofit page for our organization is on Facebook is Sans Douleur, which is S A N S, capital D O U L E U R international advocacy group and um we can also uh, facilitate information there for you Um, well you all know i'm on facebook or you can email (laughs) me at (laughs) at prophet carla at gmail.com um and also if you want to reach me through that advocacy page you can do that as well okay well, we're almost out of time. Um, I, I want to also ask, uh, anything, do you have anything coming up, on um, Pastor Julie or uh, Prophet Kyle? you guys have anything coming up that you want to announce? No, so far n- nothing um, for this year. In 2017, we have a lot planned, but not mm-hmm. on my end. Okay. I'll make sure that we, you know, any future events that we have for the advocacy group or um, anything with Sassy Ministries that we make sure we post it on our Facebook page, When Christians Speak. Uh, Mm -hmm. Right now, Sassy, we're doing um, a Bible study, group study called Discerning the Voice of God. We're on week three. We'll start week four next week. So anyone that's not too late to join, we're kind of taking it. Low, so you can visit Sassy Ministries on Facebook. Our Sassy Women Study is our group, and um, that's pretty much all I have going on. But I did want to say um, we did kind of address a lot towards ministry leaders and community leaders and just making sure that you're prepared to deal with situations concerning domestic violence. But I also want to honor the women in other countries that are listening, not just the United States, but all around the world who live in places where domestic violence is not a crime, where their voice is silenced, and they have to live this day to day. We're praying for you. We're praying that you're able to get out of those situations, that you get the help that you need. And if you ever need someone to reach out to or to talk to, feel free to reach out to the ministry Uh, We're here to help and to continue to pray for you and cover you and your children. Um, I know domestic violence is not just an American thing, but it's a world crisis. And Mm -hmm. there's over 603 million women that are dealing with domestic violence situations every day. So we want to, you know, want you to know that we haven't forgotten about those who don't have a voice, those who don't have prosecutors and attorneys and police officers and community workers fighting on their behalf. Amen. 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 Well, again, uh, you will be able to listen to this broadcast again in its tally. 
in Cali, uh, probably later on, uh, we're going to listen through, through the different media. We're going to play all the different announcements at the end. Uh, we encourage you, to, those that are listening, to share this broadcast. This is very important, and not just for the, the month of, because we're in the month of October, but this is a very um, serious thing that, that that operate in the church behind closed doors and in some cases out front. So we are very serious about this, and we want to encourage anyone that is going through uh, any kind of domestic to, is to get help. You know, uh, yes, 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 we are praying for you, and there are people praying, but we also encourage you to definitely get help. And we definitely want to thank um, Pastor Julie uh, for being with us, and um, of, of course, uh, Prophet Collar for uh, um, it, it, the, uh, the things that God is doing in her life. Amen. So what we're going to do, I'm going to turn everything back over to you. Again, I'm talking too much. I wasn't supposed to do this. I saw my name on the thing and said co- yeah. co-host. I was like, huh, co-host? No. <laughs> but uh, okay, <laughs> Prophet. <laughs> no, so I please. appreciate your help because I am battling this cold, but nevertheless, this is something that's very near and dear to all of us. So it's something that we need to continually have conversations about. So I'll go ahead and close us out um, in a word of prayer. And if anyone wants to give feedback, comment, share their story, please feel free to send us a message on Facebook on When Christians Speak um, Facebook page, and we'll be sure to get your story out there and, and share and connect with you in prayer. Amen. Amen. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we know there are so many people who live in darkness as a result of abusive relationships. Father, we pray that you will help them to recognize that abuse can take many forms, not just physical, but mental, verbal, emotional, and spiritual as well. Father God, we pray that you will enlighten them. Father God, provide them with the wisdom to see that when things are not right within their relationships, where frustration and confusion exist, Father God, even when they feel powerless or fearful, Father God, grant them your peace and uphold them with your mighty and victorious hand, Father God. We just thank you for the hedge of protection over their lives. We just stand against all types of domestic violence and abuse, Father God, within our families, within our our church families, in our communities, Father God, we bind up every spirit associated with them, Father God, that is not of you. We command, Father God, everything that was sent to destroy them, Father God, that you lift up a standard, Father God, that you remove it right now in the name of Jesus. Father God, everything that was sent to destroy their self-respect, their self-worth, their confidence, leave them, leaving them with low self-esteem, Father God, depression, Father God, we bind it up right now in the mighty name of Jesus. We ask that you bring healing, forgiveness, Father God. Show them that they are a person who deserves to be loved, feel safe, and respected, Father God. We cry out for those who are being abused, that they will recognize when they feel dominated, disgraced, and even rejected, that they can stand up and declare that no weapon formed against them shall prosper in the name of Jesus, because they are delivered by the blood of Jesus, and they are children of the Most High God. We just thank you, Father God, for every woman, every man, every child who has been a victim of domestic violence. We pray that you will lead them to your word, that they will be purified and made whole in your sight. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 Again, everyone, you have been listening to One Christian Speak Talk Radio. Amen. We have been excited. We've been talking about Domestic Violence Awareness Month with Prophet Carla Johnson. Amen. And um, uh, my sister here, and I just had a singing moment, so y'all got to forgive me. <laughs> I just can't believe I just did that. Amen. <laughs> From Prophet Julie. Pastor, <laughs> Pastor Julie. You, you know things are not right when you start here. I'm going to keep calling her Pastor Julie, you right? <laughs> Pastor <laughs> Prophet. Sorry, we talked about that earlier. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but this is, a, yeah, this is a very serious conversation. Yeah, we uh, um, are able to, to smile and everything, but this is a very serious thing that are going on in the church, and we pray that those in leadership will definitely um, address this, man. And everything, and um, get help, get the knowledge. You know, um, use some of the information that Julie has given out 
about getting con- in contact with the local um, um, governments and all that kind of stuff. But do let's do this and everything. Let's get educated about this thing. And yes, we want to definitely continue to keep those lifted up and fair. So, so Julia, again, uh, we uh, thank you uh, 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 always. It's always a pleasure to have you on. And yes, same talk here. About these things, man. It's you know, and we'll definitely keep you in proper color. And, and your advocacy group in prayer. Amen. So until next time, Thank y'all, you. God bless. Amen. Thank you again. Thank you, Prophet Carl. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Good night. We invite you to join us every Tuesday at 7 p.m. for His Abounding Grace with Minister Vanessa Williams. On Wednesdays at 7 p.m., Challenge to Change where real transformation begins with you. That's with Pastor Paul Morgan of Chosen Generation Ministries in Richmond, Virginia. On Thursdays, live at 12 noon, join Reverend Pat Randall for declaring the finished work. Reverend Ray and friends are here on Friday nights at 7 p.m. with the joy of the Lord on Friday Night Joy. Sundays at 7 p.m., Join Reverend Ray for Bread of Life. And don't forget our monthly broadcast. The first Mondays of every month, join Apostle Shirley Jones for Lifeline at 7 p.m. And on every third Monday of the month, join Evangelist Louis McElwain for Adoration at 7 p.m. Every fourth Saturday of the month, Alabaster Box at 7 p.m. with Prophetess Carla Johnson. You're listening to When Christians Speak Talk Radio, a platform for Christians to talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ, missions, and other topics related to Christian living and services to the community. The view... When Christian Speak Talk Radio is a non-profit ministry, we are dedicated to spreading the gospel of Jesus through our programs and special guests. We exist through the generous support of our listeners. If you are being blessed through this ministry and would like to give a love offering, go to our website and click on our donation page. Your donation will be processed through PayPal. Our prayer is that you may prosper, be in good health, even as your soul prospers. Unto the Lord.